December 1, 1993, Northwest Airlink Flight 5719, a Jetstream 31 turboprop with 18 people on board, is preparing to land at Chisholm Hibbing Airport in Hibbing, Minnesota. It's nighttime and the weather is poor with freezing temperatures and precipitation in the area. The pilots are cleared to land on runway 31, but due to a tailwind, they elect to land in the other direction on runway 13 instead. While on approach about two miles from the runway, the plane strikes some trees and impacts the ground, killing all on board. Why did the plane impact trees so close to the airport? Was weather a factor in this crash? Could this have been avoided? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello, Gus. Uh, we're back with another episode. Guess what I'm going to do right now, Chris? You're going to say, hey, you should follow Black Box Down pod on Twitter and Instagram and check out our Facebook page, our YouTube page. And you know what? Also, our premium uh, first class experience at blackboxdownpod.com. Man, I don't even need to be here. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, because that's, <laughs> that's where people can get episodes early and ad free and get some uh, special premium content. First class. Yeah. Yeah, man, you nailed it. You got it all. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. I guess we actually have to yes. talk about uh, an incident here. This is an interest. Well, they're all interesting. Um, this is, I should say, maybe a particularly scary incident. Ooh. So Northwest Airlink Flight 5719, like we said, was a passenger flight from Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, International Airport. It was heading up to International Falls Airport at International Falls Minnesota, but it had a stopover at mm -hmm. um, the Chisholm Hibbing Airport in Hibbing, Minnesota. And this is back December 1st, 1993. So you can imagine, like I said in the beginning, it was nighttime and the weather was kind of poor. You can imagine northern Minnesota mm -hmm. in early December. You know, right. uh, it's cold. Yeah. You spent much time in Minnesota, Chris? No, I don't know if I've ever been, actually. I spent a couple of winter. My old job, I had to go up there uh, in winter time for some oh. reason. It, it gets cold. It's yeah. really cold, dude. <laughs> So this flight had uh, two pilots, of course. The captain was 42-year-old Marvin Fallitz, and the first officer was 25-year-old Chad Erickson. Fallitz was the pilot flying at the time of the crash. He had 7,852 hours, specifically 2,266 hours in this type of plane. Erickson, however, on the other hand, had only 65 hours of experience in this type of aircraft. Oh, that's not much at all. No, no. But, you know, of course, well, the... Rules were different back then. Mm -hmm. um, he he. That doesn't mean he only had sixty five hours of flying time. It just meant in yeah. this particular yeah, type. Yeah. And I guess when you think about it, that's still like like days flying the plane. Right. Yeah. And I bet that plane didn't do like long trips, right? So. Well, that that's a that's a great segue, Chris. Ooh. So this was a Jetstream thirty one. It's a twin engine turboprop. So yeah, not a very big plane. Mm -hmm. uh, like a small regional twin turboprop. There were, in addition to the two pilots, there were 16 passengers on board as well. So just to put it in perspective, like how small this plane is. Mm -hmm. This specific plane was manufactured in May of 1986 by British Aerospace uh, at its factory in Restwick, Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, it was given a certificate of airworthiness for export to the United States, August 14th, 1986, or it was accepted by Express One and operated under the terms of the marketing agreement as Republic Express. So it had only been you know, flying in the U.S. for a little over seven years at this point. So not terribly old. And this was one of those regional airlines. That's why I say mm -hmm. it was, op it was you know, accepted by Express One, you know, operated as Republic Express uh, or operated by Express Airlines 2 as Northwest Airlines, well, for mm -hmm. Northwest Airlines as Northwest Airlink. So it's like a, like a nesting doll of regional airlines that all, you know, say that they're Northwest Airlines. Okay. And of course, Northwest Airlines doesn't even exist anymore. I think Delta bought them. So neither Fallitz nor Ericsson were scheduled to take this flight in question. They had flown together twice in, uh, in previous months, and Fallitz was informed just a day before this flight that he would be flying, and Ericsson had been notified just a few days prior on November 27th. Several witnesses had reported that Fallitz told them he was unhappy with the schedule change because it meant he would be working on December 2nd, which was a day he was scheduled to be off. Oh. Yeah, not, not happy about that. I don't think anyone would be. No, no, of course not. There had been some other things. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on this a bit. Uh, Fallitz was unhappy with some decisions in general, which we'll, we'll kind of touch on here in a little while. So 5719 was 40 minutes late in taking off from Minneapolis, St. Paul, and this was due to a late arrival and the replacement of landing light bulbs at the airport. 
little little bit of, of, of side note, a little bit of trivia here I wanted to mention. You know, I like we mentioned a couple episodes ago, I got my private pilot license. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, of course, I could I could never fly a plane like this. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. would need much, I would need much more training. But I wanted to talk about landing light bulbs for just a second here. Okay. If you're, you know, a private pilot flying at night, like let's say I went and I got in a Cessna and, you know, wanted to fly around Austin at night. Legally, you do not need a landing light bulb. <laughs> what? Yeah, you don't need landing lights. The only requirement Wait, for... At the airport, you don't need landing light bulbs? No, on the plane. Oh. It's like a, the landing lights kind of, you could think of it kind of like a, a headlight, kind of illuminates mm. uh, in front of you. Okay. So, so, and they were replacing the bulbs on the plane? Correct. Okay. The only time you need a landing light is if you're carrying passengers for hire, which in this case, you know, of course, it's an airline, so they are carrying passengers for hire, so they do legally require a landing light on that plane. But if I wanted to just go up and I was like, hey, Chris, you want to go fly around Austin at night with me? Yeah. And we get to the airport and the landing lights on the plane's not working. I'd be like, yeah, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll take off anyway. And I'd be like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> um, just like one of those weird uh, um, little bits of trivia. I should say, I should specify that's for like visual flight rules, visual flying, uh, just to be clear. Anyway, so, you know, they're 40 minutes late. The plane came in late. Uh, they had to swap out the landing light bulb. And they were further delayed because, you know, before they were getting ready to take off, they figured out that they were overweight for departure. Ooh. So plane was driven. We've talked about incidents with this before. Mm-hmm. So they had to remove one passenger from the aircraft. Oh. Yeah. In order to make their weight so that they could take off. It, it was this like they'd overbooked the plane or they had too much or that one passenger was like, how, how is it determined who gets kicked off? So I've, I've actually been on planes where this happens. Uh, it's not a good feeling. Typically, in my experience, what I've seen is they'll ask for a volunteer. Mm. Oh, and they give you a voucher or something. Right. Yeah. They'll rebook you on a later flight and they'll give you a voucher. That, that's the way I've seen it happen in the past. I imagine that's probably what happened here. They probably came on. They were like, hey, there's too many people on the plane. Is there a volunteer who wants to take a later flight? And uh, someone did. And I'm sure to this day, they're probably oh. like, wondering about the possibilities. Yeah. That's, those are the scary things. Like, Yeah. So... Eventually, the plane does depart at 6.52 p.m., heading up for Chisholm Hibbing Airport, you know, which, as we mentioned, was the stopover before you know, it got to International Falls. Around 7.50 p.m., the flight approached the Chisholm Hibbing Airport for landing, uh, and at the time, there was light snowfall and freezing drizzle. The plane was cleared for a landing on runway 31, but the flight crew requested an approach to runway 13 instead because there was a tailwind on the approach to 31, and, of course, the runway was also covered with precipitation. So... You know, when there's a tailwind, you require a lot more runway to land. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, when there's, you know, when the runway is wet or slick, then you need more runway to land. Mm. So, you know, like these two factors compound, it's like, well, we're going to need, in order to be safe, we should land in the other direction. With that way, there's a headwind. So even though there's precipitation, like we're eliminating the tailwind uh, aspect of this. Yeah. So you slow down faster. Right. Exactly. Uh, You don't, you know, you have less risk of running off the end of the runway. And runway, so, and we've talked about this before, runway 31 and runway 13 would be the exact same runway, just facing opposite directions. Yeah, because it's, and it's, it's based like the 360 degrees of like 130 and 310, right? Exactly. That's why like the runway, it's 18 is the difference because it's 180 degrees in another direction. So we're going to, we'll, we'll get a, a little technical here for just a second. Runway... One three had what they call a non-precision approach, which meant that it only had a localizer and had no glide slope. What that means is, so if you imagine like when, you know, like we said, this was not great visibility, not great mm-hmm. weather that they were going through, you know, pilots can still land uh, or commercial pilots can still land by using their instruments to figure out where they're going. When you say there's a localizer only, that means that there's only horizontal guidance for where the plane should be to line up to the runway. The glide slope is the vertical guidance. Those are those little dots, right? Are those little dots, the little lights that like tell you what slope you're coming in at? Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of. Those that would be like a, a pappy. Um, poppy, poppy, pappy. Yeah. Well, that that <laughs> that gives you vertical guidance if you can see it, if there's visual. Mm. But if you can't see it, if there's poor weather, then you have to rely on your instruments to give you that data. Okay. So imagine they had no vertical guide. Imagine you're flying through a cloud. And you can, the, the instruments are only telling you if you're left or right of the runway, but they're not telling you mm. how far up or down you are. Okay. Yeah, and they're not telling you if you're on that slope to come in to land. And so the instruments are, 
it's like communicating with instruments on the ground, like exactly hey, move to left or right, but they don't say move up or down. Okay, Ex- exactly. That's exactly it. Ideally, you know, you want to have both. That way, that, if you had both, that's called a precision approach because then you know you can you know exactly if you're on the right path, and then when you bust out of the clouds, you know, at a low altitude, you know, like bam, the runway's right there, land. Yeah. So the pilot delayed the start of the plane's descent which meant that the aircraft would have to descend at an excessive rate. We've talked about these kinds of descents before, the slam dunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They stay high. Yeah, then at the very last minute, they descend quickly. Yeah, we have uh, aviation explanations, little animated bits on both the slam dunk landing and the pappy. There you go. Yeah, we do. YouTube, black box down. Black box down, yeah. So when making the final descent onto the landing strip, the aircraft struck the top of a tree, continued for more than 600 feet, and struck a group of aspen trees. And finally, the plane collided with two ridges and came to rest inverted, lying on its right side. And all 18 people on board were killed. So if you don't have the, like the, the, the instrument system to tell you whether or not to go, uh, you're too high or too low, you're purely doing it off visual? Okay, so n- no. The way it would work here in a non-precision approach mm-hmm. is that... Every, well, not every, there are for, how can I put this, for lots of airports, they have what they call an approach plate. And it's just a diagram that shows you like navigation waypoints and what altitude you should be at each waypoint. Oh, okay. So like they would have, they would have looked up the approach plate for, in this case, it would be like the non-precision approach for runway 13 at Hibbing Airport. Mm -hmm. And it would say like, you know, hit this, you know, waypoint, we've talked about these waypoints and these navigations, like. Make sure when you're at this waypoint, make sure you're at 3,500 feet. Then, you know, by the time you get to the next waypoint, you're cleared down to 2,400 feet. So it's like kind of like a step down process. Yeah. So it's. And then, and then the very, very important, there's also a minimum descent altitude on these plates that say, like, under no condition, go any lower than this. And if you don't see the runway Mm. at this altitude, then you have to go around. You cannot land. You have to have. A minimum visibility, and a, there's a minimum altitude you can get to. And if you don't see the runway, you have to uh, go around and you know maybe go to a different airport. And just to be clear, right? There's it's not required to have lights on the plane, landing lights, but there the, the runway is all lit up with lights, right? Man, you're a, you're asking really good questions. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, there are uh, lights on the runway. However, at this specific airport, the Hibbing Airport they have what's called pilot-controlled lights. And uh, this is actually really cool. I don't know if people know this. Mm -hmm. Uh, At some smaller airports, they don't want to leave the lights on all night because it's just a waste of electricity. Like a small airport where it's like, they might get one or two flights a night, if that. Mm -hmm. What's the point in leaving the lights on all night? So what you can do is, as a pilot, you tune your radio to a specific frequency and you click your you click the microphone. And depending on the number of times you click, you activate the lights either at low... Well... You can turn the lights on, and some airports, you can change the intensity from low to medium to high. By clicking the radio. Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. Like, click as in you, you, you turn to the radio, and then you're like, click, click, <laughs> click, or is there like a button? <laughs> the button you would push, the button you would push to talk, like on a walkie-talkie. Uh-huh. Imagine just clicking that. Oh, and it makes a little click, click, click. Uh, well, it doesn't make a sound. It's just the actual, like, engaging of engaging the Engaging of it? Turn- yeah. Huh. So if you click... If you click it three times within five seconds, it turns the lights on low. If you that click it five crazy. times within five seconds, it turns it on medium. And then if you click it on seven times within five seconds, it turns it on high. Mo- some airports just have on and off, but lots of airports have the different intensities you can that's set. That's clicking really fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not that bad. It's not okay. that fast. But that, that's cool. That, I had no idea that was a thing, and that's super cool. Yeah, and then when you do that, the lights will stay on for 15 minutes. Then, you know, if you need them on longer, you just re-click it again. And what's the, the range is pretty good on that? I guess because it's radio, huh? Yeah, yeah. I so, mean, you can get you can get it, you know, as long as your radio is transmitting, you can do it for quite a ways. Yeah. Who, whoever invented that, good on them. Yeah, it's neat. Uh, when I did my training, that's what I had to do because I did, you know, night landings over mm-hmm. in uh, Branham and Lockhart and both those turn off at night. So it's like, <laughs> as, I'm, as you're practicing landing at night, it's like, oh no, do I need to reset the timer? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's it's a neat system. Well, yeah, would you, so would you ever like cycle it? Be like, turn off, turn back on. <laughs> oh no, you can't turn it off. You just can reset the timer. Okay, cool. So it's like you turn it on, and, yeah, and then like you'll be landing, and you'll be like, ah, oh, it's been a few minutes. Let me click it again just to make sure. Let me reset the yeah, fifteen minute yeah. timer. That's good, actually, that you can't turn it off because that means if someone else is like using it, 
You can't yeah. turn off their lights. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And in this case, this field had it, and the first officer uh, had to turn on uh, the lights. That's why, that's why I bring it up. Okay. No, it's cool. So the investigation was carried out by the National Transportation Safety Board, which dispatched an investigative team from Washington, D.C. early the next morning following the crash. The team was composed of a number of groups, including operations, air traffic control weather, human performance and maintenance records, and special reports were also prepared for the cockpit voice recorder and aircraft performance. This particular kind of plane at the time was not required to have a flight data recorder. I believe at the time the law was if it was a passenger plane that was capable of carrying 19 or less passengers, they didn't need a flight data recorder. So they didn't have one, but they did have a cockpit voice recorder. Mm -hmm. The team interviewed parties, including the FAA, Jetstream Aircraft Limited, Express Airlines, ALPA, Dowdy Aerospace, Allied Signal Corporation. So they're, you know, in any investigation, they're going to interview as many people as they could. So initially, they, you know, they're going to look at icing as a possible cause of the crash. Oh, like icing messing up the instruments? Or the, like the wing, like maybe the plane mm. couldn't fly anymore. Maybe it, got, it had ice build up on the wing or maybe, you know, like we've talked about before, like in a pitot tube or something. And then like they first they speculate like maybe this slam dunk that we see, because they, they, since there's no flight data recorder, they have to rely on air traffic control radar to see what mm-hmm. the plane actually did. And they're like, maybe this isn't a slam dunk that he's doing. Maybe that's like the plane crashing. Oh, Yeah. Like it was like an uncontrolled descent, you know, and they go through it and they figure out, they figure out pretty quickly. It's not an icing problem. The NTSB ruled that although the cloud ceiling was near the minimum and ice may have accumulated on the airframe, the conditions were subsequently as forecast and should not have presented any significant difficulties to the flight crew during the approach and anticipated landing. Okay. So they decide to focus around Fallot's performance as captain. And they find out that he kind of has a checkered history uh, as a pilot. Oh, he had failed proficiency checks previously in 1988, 1992, and earlier in 1993. And two of his flight evaluation write-ups listed his crew coordination as unsatisfactory. Mm. And, you know, we've talked about this many times. Coordination and CRM is super important for safety in a cockpit. Crew resource management. Yeah, crew resource. Thank you. Sometimes cockpit resource management. People say it means different things. Despite all this, however, Fallitz did pass his most recent test in November of 1993, so a month before the incident. Fallitz was described as highly intelligent, but five of six pilots interviewed who had flown uh, with him as his first officer said they were intimidated by him. Oh. The evidence collected indicated that Fallitz delayed uh, initiating the descent into Chisholm Hibbing Airport, and this action created the need for a very steep rated descent to complete the approach. Like we said, he was doing this slam dunk. He wasn't following. Remember, I told you, Mm -hmm, normally mm -hmm. there's like a step down of altitudes that you would do. Uh, He didn't do that. He stayed high and then tried to do this slam dunk. So in executing this slam dunk, or this, I should say, the steep descent rate, he was descending between 2,000 to 2,200 feet per minute, when typically you would not want to do more than about 1,000 feet per minute. So he was descending about a little over twice as fast as what would be expected. And what was there? How high up were they? What was their altitude? I don't think I said, but off the top of my head, I want to say that they were at about 5,000 feet when they started that descent. I I could be wrong on that. I'm going off the top of my head, but I want to say they were at about 5,000. That's not that high up. Yeah, but but when they started this descent at their initial approach fix, I believe they should have been at 3,500. So right off the bat, they were from their initial descent, they were 1,500 feet above that, much less you know, following the step down. Yeah. I want to say the minimum descent altitude for Hibbing was at the time was 2,040 feet. So they were 3,000 feet above where they should have been when they call um, mm. missed approach or not. So it's, it's, it's pretty high. And you don't, you don't want to be making a steep descent like that. You want, to, you, know, you want it to be smooth and nice, so uh, you know, follow the instruments. It should have just, we're going to do a go around, right? Well... They should, he sh- not even, should have been a, a more gradual descent early on. So, you know, the, the, the initial question is just like, why, why didn't did they he do that? Right. Why didn't they do it as published? Why were they doing this slam dunk approach? And like I said, this steep descent rate was continued past the final approach fix at more than twice the maximum specified by airline procedures. So like I said, they're really descending fast. The high rate of descent was not arrested by the captain, and the airplane passed through the step down uh, fixed altitude, and the aircraft crashed well short of the airport. So, like I said, he started this very steep descent and then went below the minimum that they were supposed to, and then ended up, you know, hitting that tree. Circumstances indicated that the flight crew experienced a loss of altitude awareness that led to a controlled collision with the terrain. Consequently, the investigation focused on why the airplane was operated at a high rate of descent 
and why it descended through minimum altitudes and why critical altitude callouts were not made. Uh, like that one, you would expect that the first officer would have been calling the altitudes out as mm -hmm. they're descending uh, or warning like, hey, we're at minimums. You know, yeah. th there, there normally is a, a, a call out that's happening. Right now, uh, you know, even though I have my pilot license, I'm actually taking training to learn these, these instrument flights and what happens. And, you know, when I'm doing these flights, my, it's, you know, you, you can't see. You have, like, you're wearing like, a, a, like this vision obstructing thing, so you can only look at your instruments. That's right, with the blast shield. <laughs> yeah, it's very similar to that. <laughs> and uh, the, the instructor who's sitting with me is always calling out those altitudes, you know, you know, or, you know, as we hit minimum, he says minimums, you know. Uh -huh. That way, you know, I know to train to look at the altitude. It's very important when you can't see outside that you're looking at that altimeter to make sure you're, you're, you're doing it as you should be. Sunglasses season is in full swing. There's no better option than our friends over at Shady Rays. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers a world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair I've worn, durable frames, and extremely clear polarized lenses for outdoor adventures. Uh, and that's not all. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection in all of eyewear. Every pair is backed by lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they told us they'll send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. Wear your Shady Rays with confidence because they will have your back long after your purchase. They also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order. They've donated over 20 million meals to date. Look good in your shades and feel good by making an impact. If you don't love them, exchange them for a new pair or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop Shady Rays. Their team always has your back. Just for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Go to ShadyRays.com, use code BLACKBOX down for 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 200,000 people. You may have noticed fall is here. Uh, you know, I think it's that time of year we're all used to maybe venturing out a little more into the outdoors, uh, maybe go do some camping, uh, you know, cozying up by a campfire with someone. You know, there's just something special about that fall air that brings people closer together. And with a smokeless fire pit from Solo Stove, creating those moments is easier than ever. Enjoy all the warmth and comfort of a fire pit, plus portability, quick setup, and cleaning. Best of all, no smoke. I've been using a Solo Stove for a little while now, and I absolutely love it. I mean, there's just so much to enjoy about it. It's got a cool design, super easy to use, and, you know, best of all, no smoke. You're not constantly dodging smoke while you're sitting around the, uh, the fire pit. And, and it just really fosters spending time outside uh, and staying warm around a fire pit. I think, you know, that, that there's something in all of us that just deep down, we all enjoy that. It's super cool opening it up, unboxing it, setting it up. Uh, it's easy. Even a dumb dumb like me can do it. So upgrade your backyard with a solo stove fire pit. Create story worthy moments without the fireside fumes, stainless steel construction designed to regulate airflow and burn more efficiently. It's so little smoke, you'll wonder how there's so much fire. It's a perfect catalyst for getting outside and spending more time with family and friends. You can build lasting memories around a solo stove fire pit. They're brilliantly engineered to be easy to use. They're built to last, easy to light with a few bits of starter. Your fire is blazing in minutes. They're so confident you'll love it. They offer a lifetime warranty and a 30-day free return policy. So prepare for your best outdoor memories yet and save big during the Solo Stove Fall event. Use promo code BLACKBOXDOWN at solostove.com for an extra $10 off. That's solostove.com, promo code BLACKBOXDOWN for $10 off on top of the fall event deals. Uh, make sure your hurry fall event ends November 10th. So... This approach to runway 13 was initiated from the southwest on a clockwise 20-mile distance measuring equipment arc at about 8,000 feet mean sea level. So what that means is, remember, like I said, they were coming into 3-1. They decided to do 1-3 instead. Mm -hmm. So they circled the airport 20 miles away from it uh, mm -hmm. at 8,000 feet in a clockwise way. So they're coming up to 3-1. They turned left to go clockwise 20 miles away from the airport to go around to 1-3 and then turn right into 1-3. Okay. The airplane intercepted the runway 13 localizer and descended from 8,000 feet down to 1,800 feet at vertical speeds between 2,000 and 3,000 feet per minute. And 3, an average. 000. Yeah, that's fast. Like we said, it should have been 1,000. Yeah, that's three times. <laughs> yeah. And their average flight path angle was about 8.3 degrees down. And typically, the angle you want when you're landing is three degrees. Ooh. Some airports are a little more, some airports are a little less, but typically that's your rule of thumb, three degrees. And they were at 8.3 degrees down, which is, again, extreme. During this time, the airplane passed the final approach fix about 1,200 feet above the minimum altitude of 3,500 feet. Within the next 2.5 nautical miles, the airplane descended below the subsequent 2,040 foot step down fix altitude. 
Mm. Uh, the airplane's rate of descent and downward flight path angle were significantly decreased after it passed through 1,800 feet, which was the last radar hit that air traffic control oh. had, and the point uh, where it struck the strand of trees. So they got to about 1,800 feet, which was the last time the radar saw them, and, which is too low. They, their minimum should have been 2,040, so they're 240 feet too low, and that's when their rate of descent was significantly decreased. Mm. The change in flight path indicates that the flight crew was applying nose-up elevator and that the airplane was responding in a positive manner. So just to be clear, you know, we, I, I keep talking about these minimum altitudes that they went too low for, and I keep talking about how they're too high. When you have a minimum altitude, you know, it's not like there's a ma- there can be maximum altitudes. In this case, there was not a maximum altitude. So in theory, there's nothing wrong with them being too high. Mm-hmm. It's just not good practice. Okay. Because then you have to you have to do these extreme descent rates that you shouldn't be doing. So you do want to stick as you know close to the minimum, uh, but you never want to go below it. Okay. Yeah, because that's when you hit things. That's when you hit something, right? That like those minimum altitudes. It's like the way it's published. Like that's telling you you're guaranteed safe if you follow these instructions. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be an obstacle. There's not going to be a tree. You know, there's not going to be anything. You you can fly down this corridor. The tree strikes where the right wing was severed and the final impact point uh, were, were perceptible on the cockpit voice recorder. The timing and distances were consistent with an impact speed of about 120 knots, which is 138 miles an hour or 222 kilometers an hour. Although the captain apparently decreased the rate of descent between 1,800 feet and the point where the trees were struck, there was no indication of this recorded on the cockpit voice recorder. Mm. So he didn't say anything, you know, he's yeah. just flying without talking. As for icing being a contributing factor, that was ruled out. Conditions at the time of the accident with visible moisture present from the surface to 8,000 feet and a ground level temperature of 29 degrees Fahrenheit could have caused ice to accumulate on the airplane at a moderate rate. However, the evidence does not indicate the airplane accumulated sufficient ice to have led to the accident. So they're saying, yeah, it's possible there could have been ice, but there, there doesn't, there's no evidence that says it was in any amount that would have caused an accident. But, you know, all, all this being said, the reports of light to moderate icing conditions in the clouds and around the airport appear to have been what influenced the captain's decision to stay above the clouds until he was close to the airport. Oh. Right. So his probable intention was to descend at a higher than normal rate of speed to minimize his time in the icing conditions. Okay. So he would have stayed above the clouds because you know the icing would have been worse in there and then tried to descend quickly in an effort to minimize time in the clouds in those conditions that were favorable for icing. Okay. The investigation revealed that this inappropriate practice was widely used within the airline and probably at other airlines. Mm. So this might just been widely used within that specific airline because of the weather and whatnot. Right, right. Like if they see a cloud, they'll just slam dunk through it to get through it quickly and avoid any potential icing. Hmm. All of the Express 2 pilots interviewed indicated it was common practice for them to descend rapidly through icing conditions. This procedure was contrary to the manufacturer's and Express 2's guideline and violated the concept of flying stabilized approaches. That's kind of what I keep saying. Like, you want to stay steady. You want to stay that at most 1,000 feet per minute. That way, you're, they, it's called stabilized. You, mm-hmm. you know, you're not doing anything crazy. Everything's under control and going smoothly. A, a nice, stabilized approach. That's what you want. The NTSB believed that the captain was not confident that the airplane could safely encounter icing conditions, thus his decision to extend to descend at an excessive rate. They say that he didn't, he's not confident. As in, did he say it on, like, how do they know that? That's what they believe. That's okay. why he, uh, he um, you know, was, was performing this, yeah. um, this type of descent. And I believe there was some exchange on the cockpit voice recorder where, you know, he's the, the first officer's asking about this descent and the captain's telling him, you know, that they're going to descend rapidly to try to minimize time in the icing conditions. Okay. Yeah, I just, I, that's this is what I keep wondering the, while we're talking. This like, whoa, what are they? What are they saying in there? Yeah, and again, this is an older cockpit voice recorder, so mm-hmm. you know it's not like nowadays where you have the entire flight or days of flights. It's you know a very limited amount of time. Yeah, so they uh, that they have just have the la- the last what like f- fifteen minutes or something. I don't know this specific plane. Uh, uh-huh. If I were to guess, I'd say somewhere probably between. 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour if they're lucky. But this was a short flight. So if it was an hour, they would have the entire thing. I'm guessing this plane is probably more like 30 minutes. Okay. According to the New York Times, the NTSB said that Fallots delayed the start of the descent, which subsequently required an excessive descent rate to reach the final approach. 
John K. Uh, Lauber, uh, a member of the NTSB, said at a meeting where the report was made public, um, and this is a quote, they were using this informal, keep it high, slam dunk approach. We were told this was common practice by this airline and a widespread practice involving turboprop airplanes, end quote. He also added, one, one last quote here, there's no justification whatever in using this slam dunk approach. Those kind of sink rates are not compatible with safety, end quote. Again, like mm-hmm. I said, don't want to be descending that quickly. It's not safe. The board was also critical of Fallot's behavior towards his first officer. The evidence suggests that the first officer, because of his probationary status and the captain's intimidating reputation, may have been reluctant to challenge the captain's decision to perform the approach in a manner contrary to uh, the airline's guidance or to call out the need to execute a missed approach. The first officer may have perceived that challenging the judgment of the captain could jeopardize his career with the airline. Remember, he's like the new employee, only has a few Mm, hours. So, you know, he's like, oh, well, you know, maybe this guy does know what he's doing. You know, it just kind of like resigns himself to sitting around. Hmm. Yeah. And, and we've talked about similar things in other incidents. Like this is a recipe for disaster. You know, there has to be a good communication between the two pilots. Yeah. Because he's intimidating. Right. Uh, <laughs> that is what they yeah. said. And, and in fact, the cockpit voice recorder transcript showed that most of the captain's communication with the first officer was either to correct him or to tell him what to do. Hmm. Uh, the captain told the first officer how to put the approach plate onto the yoke clip, how to set up the radios, how to put the altitude on standby frequency of the ADF, how to call a station, when to do the checklist. So he was micromanaging everything the first officer, he was telling the first officer what to do and then micromanaging every step of it. Instead of just like communicating like normal back and forth or like letting him do his job and him doing his job. Right. right. And right. And you know, the whole point of this is by telling the first officer to do these tasks, the captain should be able to then focus on just flying the plane. Yeah. So now the captain is, you know, flying the plane and then micromanaging all of the other tasks that should have been delegated. Which is actually the probably worse than doing it himself. Right. Because <laughs> right. now he's, like, focused on watching and correcting and, yeah. Yeah, it's not good. So on top of this, uh, Erickson did not alert the captain about their descent below minimum descent altitude, probably because he was performing other duties as uh, directed by the captain. The NTSB said that Erickson's inaction with regard to callouts contributed to the breakdown in crew coordination that led to the accident. Again, remember, like I said, the first officer should have been calling out altitudes mm-hmm. and then letting him know when they got to their minimum altitude. And been like, oh, minimum altitude 2,000 approaching. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time the airplane began to collide with the trees, the captain was actually telling the first officer how to turn on the lights at the airport. Remember oh. I told you earlier? <laughs> he was telling, you click it seven times. Right. He was like, he was, you know, oh. he was trying to explain to him that process, which presumably the, the first officer should know how to, yeah. I know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to do it now too. Yeah. <laughs> and plus, like I told you, it's not that hard. It's the, what I, I explained it to you. It, like all you have to know now is the frequency for the specific airport and it's on the plate that, uh, that he's, that's in front of him. And they could have done it way earlier. As you said, they said it's got distance. So, right. Yeah. But remember, you don't want to do it too mm. early since there's that 15 minute timer. Okay. So, you know, you want to make sure you're pretty close. That way you don't, you know, it doesn't turn off as you're trying to touch down and land. It's kind of, kind of, it's kind of condescending this, the, the, like his approach with the first officer, right? It's just like, yeah, yeah. Not, maybe uh, not intentionally, but like that's his. It doesn't foster good communication and feedback. Yeah. The statements of the first officer on the cockpit voice recorder suggested a tense and almost reserved attitude toward the captain. Information provided by the first officer to the captain was couched in a questioning manner rather than as an assertion. So, you know, he's like kind of being timid uh, Mm. anytime that he says anything. On the other side, the actions of the captain, as recorded in the cockpit voice recorder, indicated an aggressive, less than receptive tone that resulted in his improper management of the flight. (sighs) So there's something I I wasn't sure if I should bring this up or not. I guess I will mention it here. This captain kind of had a reputation for being like quick to fly off the handle and difficult to work with. Like I said, some of the other pilots he had flown with said they were intimidated by him. The report does say that in the past, if he had been in a bad mood or was angry with the airline, that he would intentionally fly the plane roughly. Oh. Yeah, to like make not a smooth flight for the passengers to kind of like get back at the airline. Oh my God. Yeah, not professional. Oh, uh, yeah, he had, I mean, he, uh, there had been some issues with the airline at the time that he was unhappy with. Like he had been 
kind of forced to move from Minneapolis out to, I think he had moved to International Falls. Yeah, they'd forced him to move to another city to operate out of when he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to move to that other city. And, uh-huh. it, you know, it was like he'd had, there were, you know, the, the airline had been treating the pilots kind of bad. And uh, he was upset about that. And, you know, like I said, he would do these things where he'd fly the plane roughly or he wasn't in the best mindset at the time. Anyway, that's, uh, that's you know, that's kind of like ancillary. It wasn't directly something that happened on this flight per se, but just something that kind of uh, like builds to, to the character, I guess. The NTSB concluded that the actions of the captain led to a steep approach and distractions of the first officer from his primary tasks at a critical phase of the approach. The NTSB said when its report was made public that the captain's record raised questions about the adequacy of his airmanship and behavior that suggested a lack of crew coordination during flight operations, including intimidation of first officers. The safety board said Erickson was distracted from his duties of monitoring the altitude as a result of untimely and poorly planned instructions from the captain. As a result, the pilots experienced a loss of altitude awareness and failed to correct the situation before ground contact was made. The NTSB ruled that these events were fostered by the captain's poor airmanship and poor interpersonal skills. The NTSB also criticized the airline for not dealing with the captain's conduct, saying that company management did not address these matters adequately. Mm. I'm not sure if you've thought about this, but some of our listeners may be wondering, why was there no like ground proximity warning system? Oh, yeah. That's something we've talked about in other places, right? You know, like the the system that automatically says, like, terrain, terrain, pull up, that kind of stuff. So like we said, this accident happened in December of 1993. Uh-huh. And the law mandated that by April of 1994, all planes needed to have ground proximity warning system. And it was a this, new technology. And this one didn't. Right. This plane did not have it yet. It was scheduled to go into service next the next month and oh get it. Oh my God. The next month? Yeah. They were, they were like the, the, the law said they needed it within the next four months and they were going to get it in the next month. So they had no ground proximity warning system to, to warn them that they were getting so close to the ground. Oh, my God. So on the bright side, you can at least feel assured yeah. that because of uh, ground proximity warning systems, something like this would be, you know, the pilots would have been alerted to it nowadays. When you said, oh, is law by law by 1994, I was like, because of this incident? But no. <laughs> no, no, no. It was no, already, it would, yeah. Right, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that, I just wanted to add that little footnote there. A good, good, good footnote. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... In the end, there was no evidence of any mechanical failures of the structure or engines that contributed to the accident. Plane was fine. Light to moderate icing conditions existed during the approach to Hibbing. However, airframe icing was not a factor in the cause of the accident. And the bulbs, when we start talking, you're like, oh, they were changing the bulbs. The bulbs were, the new bulbs were working and everything. Yeah, so. yeah, they were fine. It just adds to the fact that they were delayed. The mm. captain was upset. Remember, he didn't want yeah, to have yeah. to work. It was going to be his day off. Plus, I thought it was an interesting thing to mention about how if you're flying like for yourself, you yeah. don't need it unless you're flying for hire. Air traffic services were appropriate, did not contribute to the cause of the accident. And you said he was uh, telling them how to turn on the light. So they, 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 he wasn't even aware that they were. Right. Like, it wasn't even like, oops, we better. He was well, pulling up, right? Yes. So they were going. They went too low. So he was aware they went too low and was pulling up. But then instead of focusing on that, he was like, oh, and here's how you turn on the boom. Yeah. I don't know if necessarily, so remember, there's no flight data recorder Uh and air traffic control lost contact at this time. So there's no way to know whether he was pulling back in order to climb or if he was pulling back to slow his descent. Mm. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily, even though he's pulling back, it doesn't mean necessarily that they started climbing. It could be that they were descending slower. Mm. Okay. That's, that's, I guess, important. uh, Yeah. Difference. The captain was flying the airplane during the approach and delayed the start of the descent that subsequently required excessive descent rate to reach the final approach fix and minimum descent height for the non-precision approach. Remember, non-precision approach just means they had no glide slope. They just had localizer. The captain's decision to initiate the excessively steep approach may have been prompted by a desire to minimize time and icing conditions. The probable causes of the accident were the captain's actions that led to a breakdown in crew coordination and the loss of altitude awareness by the flight crew during an unstabilized approach in night instrument meteorological conditions. Contributing factors included the failure of the company management to adequately address the previously identified deficiencies in airmanship and crew resource management of the captain, the failure of the company to identify and correct a widespread unapproved practice during instrument approach procedures, uh, and the FAA's inadequate surveillance and oversight of the air carrier. So. This accident was, you know, caused by the captain, but the NTSB is pointing out that the airline 
kind of fostered this culture and kind of allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. So even though the captain was the one flying and had a bad attitude, had bad procedures and poor airmanship, this is something that could have been caught. The airline should have taken action for this well before it got to this point. The captain did not exercise proper crew coordination during the approach, and his actions led to distractions during critical phases of the approach, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. He was you know, micromanaging the first officer. The first officer did not adequately monitor the approach and alert the captain of the unstabilized nature of the approach and of the descent. And it could be also the first officer was maybe not familiar with this slam dunk approach, so maybe he just didn't know what the captain was doing. Oh. And because it's not, you know, according to the approach plate, which the first officer would have understood. And mm -hmm. being the new guy, he was, he was probably, he might have been thinking, oh, maybe this is the way they do it. I'll just watch him and figure out what this is. Yeah. Again, that's speculation. There's no way to know that for certain. The flight crew lost altitude awareness and allowed the airplane to descend below mandatory level off points, including minimum descent altitude for the approach. And the airplane descended into the ground short of the runway. I will say that the first officer should have been watching the altitude. Regardless of not knowing what's going on, mm -hmm. he should definitely at least, you know, have understood the minimum altitudes and known that that's a danger. You cannot yeah. go and below your minimums. She should have been aware of it and calling it out. Yeah, exactly. The captain's record raised questions about the adequacy of his airmanship and behavior that suggested a lack of crew coordination during flight operations, including intimidation of first officers. Company management did not address these matters adequately. The first officer was distracted from his duties of monitoring the altitude as a result of untimely and poorly planned instructions from the captain. The plane also lacked a ground proximity warning system, which would have provided timely warning to the crew and should have prevented the accident. And like I said, ground proximity warning system had been required on larger airliners and then, you know, were required on commuter aircraft with 10 or more seats. And they were scheduled to get theirs in the next month. Mm. And finally here, the NTSB made a couple of recommendations to the FAA. Develop specific guidance for the evaluation and oversight of contract training programs used by air carriers and incorporate such guidance for FAA principal inspectors to use in approving training programs. So just kind of a training review. Issue an air carrier operations bulletin directing principal operation inspectors to advise air carriers to re-emphasize in pilot training materials the necessity for adhering to the maximum descent rate of 1,000 feet per minute after passing the final approach fix, regardless of the existence of icing conditions. So don't slam dunk once you pass the final approach fix, you know? Yeah. Uh, keep it stabilized. Keep it smooth. You know, anything greater than 1,000 feet per minute doesn't kind of feel good anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're in the plane, it's, uh, it's, it, it's not, not a good time, you know? Yeah, I'm trying to think uh, of, like, I've experienced that uh, just flying, you know, at, in general. Like, is there a chance that, like, normal just passengers might have experienced something that that quick of a descent it's possible um you know um it, it's funny when you think about it like a thousand feet per minute is about 11 miles an hour two thousand feet per minute is about 22 23 miles an hour something like that so it's not like you know you're screaming going really fast at the ground but it, it, it can get uncomfortable and again like we've talked about before you don't necessarily feel the speed you feel mm -hmm. the acceleration and when you start accelerating that quickly to the ground that's when you start to feel it you might get like your stomach might rise a little bit, kind of like mm. cresting a roller coaster mm -hmm, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if you felt that, maybe, but, you know, typically, hopefully, you don't feel that when you're on a plane. Develop a clear and specific directive to flight standards inspectors and managers that emphasizes the need for compliance with existing FAA orders, directives, and other guidance material during the certification and surveillance of commuter air carriers. Issue an airworthiness directive requiring operators of two pilot airplanes, including the Jetstream 3100, presently equipped with only the left wing ice observation light to install a right wing ice observation light so just put an, a light on the right wing so pilots can see if there's icing or not mm -hmm. again icing didn't contribute to this crash but it might give pilots a peace of mind to that way they can look and see if there's icing or not require that airplanes certificated for two pilot operation be configured with ice observation lights illuminating both wings kind of the same thing and lastly require that all pilots operating aircraft have access to their own set of approach charts yeah so that both pilots can look at the approach chart in front of them and typically you know, when they're coming in before they land, the pilots will review the approach chart or the approach plate and, you know, brief it. That way they know exactly what's going on. They know we're going to come here. We're going to make this turn. These are our altitudes. If we miss it, you know, we're going to do this as our missed approach and just go through all the possibilities. That way they know what they're getting into. And they, you know, yeah. they've coordinated it ahead of time. But yeah, that's it. That's it for uh, Northwest Airlink 5719. Like I said, this, it's, it's a scary one. It's, it, it's, yeah. yeah, it's like, it's frustrating because it's, well, there was no issues mechanically. It was just like a grumpy pilot flying the plane incorrectly. 
Yeah. And 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 bad, I guess a bad crew resource management for the, you know, which again, grumpy pilot. I feel like we need a shirt that says grumpy pilot now. <laughs> okay, I kind of like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, th- this one's just unsettling just because, like you say, so so unnecessary, uh, so so easily avoidable with, with, with the, what they already had. Yeah. What, what, what is settling, like you said, is the system that would have l- let them know that they were going to hit the ground is now installed and mandatory. So Correct, yeah. That, that's what makes you feel like better about it. It's like, oh yeah, well this wouldn't have happened a month later. Yeah. And on top of that, like that system exists and that system has been improved. Like ground proximity warning systems were installed back then. Now we have enhanced ground proximity warning systems, which are even better. You know, there's a lot more technology that uh, makes this a whole lot safer. And this was a smaller plane, smaller airport that didn't have the, uh, the system that lets you know how quickly to descend. A glide slope. The glide slope. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was no, there was also, just for clar- clarity, there was no tower at this airport. Like, it's a small, mm. um, the kind of remote airport. But not that that contributed to it necessarily, just to kind of set in your mind, yeah. you know, how small yeah. it is. But that's it for this episode. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, and uh, like, like we said earlier, don't forget to give us a follow on social media. I'll, I'll, what I'll do on social media, I'll, I'll make a note to myself here. I'll mm-hmm. post what the approach plate looked like for them. I saw it. It was in, it was in, the, in the NTSB report for this incident. I'll post it. That way you can see... For yourself, you know, mm. uh, what it looks like, you know, with the step down altitudes and everything. And I looked it up to nowadays, the approach plate's actually different for this airport. Uh, this circle uh, on the 20 mile DME that they did, I don't think is on there anymore. Anyway, I'll look again. I'll, I'll post it on social media. Go check us out, Black Box Down Pod. Yeah. And uh, tell your friends. Tell a friend in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell your friends uh, or enemies or, you know, acquaintances. One of them, any of them, all of them. Why would you want to tell your enemies? I don't know, man. You know, like it's, you, you might be a thing that bond, that you, you might not be enemies afterwards. Maybe you're like, hey, I really appreciate that podcast recommendation. Let's It'll be friends. bring people together. <laughs> yeah. Let's, 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 let's get over our, our differences. Yeah. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye.